Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking from Washington, D.C. It is our December 7th program being recorded here on the afternoon of Friday, December 6th in Washington. Um, We'll have something to say about the Pearl Harbor anniversary with new research uh, still ongoing that I think will transform the general view of this. I would also point everybody's attention to C-SPAN. That lecture on the Russian fleets just won't quit. The last time I looked, it was number eight in the last week and number 14 in the previous 30 days. And I'm sure there are people out there who haven't seen it and who uh, need to see it because of the view that it gives to the entire 150 years of past history. And uh, people who have seen it once might uh, also profit or do me the favor of of clicking on it again. The goal of all this, of course, is um, to get it rebroadcast. The the ultimate goal is to try to put U.S.-Russian relations on a rational basis, right? The American people, I don't believe, are hostile to Russia in any way. But this degenerate, decadent elite in Washington, right, these uh, people who uh, run the foreign policy, uh, they seem to have this tremendous animus against Putin. They're causing a crisis now in Ukraine over this. As uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov said, there's hysteria in Western Europe about Ukraine. We're trying to cut the hysteria. So getting that broadcast on C-SPAN during Christmas week or something at the end of the year would be a great thing. And they do need Civil War material, so they might as well take that as recycle some tired uh, lectures by uh, various people. And then the other big thing, and this is our first uh, substantive topic, Syria, the possibility of you to do something positive to help Syria. We have Mother Agnes Mariam of the Melkite Catholic Monastery and Convent of Kara in Syria. And uh, she has been on a very successful North American, that is U.S.-Canadian tour. She has also made side trips to Britain, to Poland, and elsewhere. And she's going to be in New York. Uh, If you hear this on on Saturday... Uh, If you're in the New York area, take a look at the Syrian Solidarity Movement website, and you will find there a calendar. You've got to look. You've got to make an effort to find it, but it's there. A calendar of her events that would be on the uh, Saturday, December 7th. Tonight, Friday, December 6th, she's going to be, I think, in Brooklyn, New York. But on Saturday, December 7th, somewhere in the New York area, take a look, see if you can drop in. might be close to you. And in any case, the uh, principal appointment is in Washington, D.C., at the National Press Club. Thanks once again to the wonderful McClendon Group at the National Press Club. Uh, She's going to be at the Press Club at 630 p.m. if you want to come early for dinner, or 7 p.m. if you just want to hear the lecture. So Tuesday evening, next, uh, Tuesday evening, and that will be at either 6.30 or 7 p.m., depending on what you're coming for, and that will be Mother Agnes Mariam giving a lecture on Syria. Now, this week I gave a commentary to press TV about Syria, and it looks um, actually very, very interesting. Uh, First of all, we had this interesting article in the London Independent, which says that General Idris, the military commander of the Free Syrian Army, and up to now a golden boy of the CIA, has now dropped his demand that Assad must leave power as a precondition for the Geneva talks. Looks like the Free Syrian Army is going to be willing to go, uh, and Idris is willing to go. Now, does that mean the CIA told him, or maybe more likely he's breaking from the CIA? 
that would also be interesting. Whatever, whichever way it is, it's interesting. Um, so Idris now says, we don't make a demand that Assad quit as a precondition, but he should leave power at the end of the negotiation process. Well, that, of course, is open-ended. That could take many years. That could take forever. So this is essentially dropping the demand. And Idris goes on to say, we are considering a united front making common cause with the Syrian Arab army, the government army, the Assad army, against Nusra and the Islamic Emirates of Sham and Iraq. In other words, the Saudi-backed Akfiris, the crazies, the terrorists, the Al-Qaeda-style people who have been holding, even now, large areas of northern Syria. If the Free Syrian Army switches sides, that will obviously have a military significance, political significance. And what you're seeing now is the uh, relentless progress of the Syrian Arab army with Hezbollah and Iran and Iraq allies towards Aleppo. Maybe the Christmas gift to the world will be the cleansing of Aleppo of terrorists, the kicking of al-Qaeda out of Aleppo for the end of the year. And, of course, uh, this, uh, the pre-Syrian army switching sides, if they, if they do that, that would be a big thing. Uh, the, other, the other problem is, of course, the Western elites have portrayed al-Qaeda. First of all, they were heroes against the Soviets. Then they became villains with the uh, 9-11. And now uh, they're heroes of democracy again. Now, if you want to demonize them again, what do you do? Well, we're getting a lot of attention in um, the London Independent, which is the source of this story about Idris that I just went through, uh, and others, and we see it in the Washington Post of today, that is of uh, of Saturday of Friday the fifth. That um, there are one thousand five hundred Westerners fighting on the side of the terrorists in uh, in Syria, and the uh, nobody knows how many of those are from the U.S. or from Europe. But the idea is that these Western terrorists, many of them recent converts to this Takfiri doctrine, uh, the holier than thou's that they may want to come back, as the original Afghansi did, right, and come back and uh, start terrorism in their home countries, and would apply the terrorist lessons of, uh, in this case, Syria, then Afghanistan, now Syria, to their home countries. And that, of course, means possible terrorism. Now, this is, of course, one of the ways the CIA might say, let's, let's switch public opinion back to hating the Al Qaeda people. Let's let's have some kind of a terrorist atrocity. It will be carried out by these Syrian terrorist veterans, and then we can demonize them in public opinion and complete the geopolitical shift. Since it looks like these uh, Nusra people, the Saudi-backed elements, are uh, are losing out. The other one, of course, remember in the background is if Prince Bandar and the Saudi intelligence want to save. Their assets in Syria, they have to probably counterattack and escalate. One way to do that is to deliver the man man pads, right? The SAMs, the shoulder fired small anti aircraft rockets, surface to air missiles that could be used then to shoot down airliners. They could be used against Assad's helicopters and fighter planes, but against the uh, commercial airliners of Lebanon, of Jordan of the Israelis, and that's a very easy path towards uh, flipping Western public opinion. So um, the general idea, though, is that the, uh, the rebellion is in trouble. Saudi foreign policy is in big trouble. So uh, if you want to say, learn more about Syria, Tuesday evening at the National Press Club here in Washington, D.C., 6.30 to 7 p.m. is the start. Mother Agnes Mariam from, uh, from the Karam Monastery Convent in Syria. Back in a minute. Back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Buster here in Washington. Please do take a look at the Russian fleets on C-SPAN. Uh, keep us up in the first uh, one or two pages of Most Watched, the seven-day list and the 30-day list on uh, the C-SPAN video library, and remember, Mother Agnes Mariam 
This coming Tuesday, National Press Club, Washington, D.C. Talk starts at 7.30, uh, dinner before that. Um, so those are the things you need to... I don't want to be too optimistic about Syria now. There is also uh, another, there's a countercurrent of the warmongers, British, French, Israeli, Saudi. The warmonger brigade is still quite active, and they're trying to come up with reasons why it's time to retrieve the non-attack of September and make that into an attack. But they are swimming against the current in the sense that the American people are absolutely sick of war, and any politician who proposes aggressive war under these circumstances, will be swept away through impeachment, being voted out of office, tarred and feathered, run out of town on a rail, and God knows what. All right, so um, let's now look at the, uh, at the big picture. Getting towards the end of the year, thinking about 2014 and indeed into uh, 20, 2015, and the idea is, We have a perspective. We have some idea of what is going to happen. This is not some kind of crystal ball. Uh, It's not a forecast, really. It's just it's a it's a combination of what is likely to happen and what needs to be done in order to deal with that. Let's let's start with a timely uh, starting point. Monsieur Mélenchon. Mélenchon is the head of the French uh, Left Party. The Parti de Gauche. Uh, and Mélenchon this week said, in the context of a debate about economics and taxation, that France is in the year 1788. Now, this means one year before a huge revolutionary upsurge. In other words, when you say in France it's 1788, it's one year before 1789. And that means uh, the revolution, in effect. I would say, a revolutionary mass strike process under our current situation. We have seen the controllers, the intelligence people behind Russell Brand in those articles in the New Statesman, quoting some little London think tank or God knows what, that there's going to be an upsurge once again in Occupy at the end of 2014, uh, 2013, 2014, 2015. We're still in that same time frame. Now, of course, the most detailed and uh, accurate statement of this was done by me in June, and you can see this on tarpley.net. You can look at it. It was my speech to the Left Forum, New York City, Pace University, in the first week of June of this year. So it's five months ago, almost to the day. And I go through this pattern that we've always seen seven years into a world economic depression from 1929 to 1936. And what do you find in 1936? Huge mass strike wave in Spain, in France, and the United States. The big sit-down strikes that gave birth to the United Auto Workers, the United Steel Workers of America, and other unions across upstate New York and many, many other areas. The uh, all kinds of workers the union movement, going from nothing to a real power within a couple of years, seven years into the Depression. Well, guess what? 2008, the World Depression started. It's now 2013. It will soon be 2014. That means 2015 is seven years into the World Depression. And here we are. We're seeing the mass strike process at work in 2013. We've seen it in Egypt. We've seen it in Turkey. We've seen it in Brazil. In Brazil, they seem to have made some intelligent uh, demands. Only in the U.S., of course, do we have uh, people who occupy public squares with no demands except that they be allowed to stay there. Absolute minimalism of demands, right? In SDS, we used to have non-negotiable demands. These characters have zero demands. I think they've learned the long lesson. What's happening in Ukraine right now shows that the tensions, the economic breakdown crisis, is creating tremendous social, political, economic tensions. These can be hijacked, as indeed by the demagogues of Ukraine, right? You've got neo-Nazis from the Svoboda party that are trying to take control of that public square. And, of course, it's just a few thousand people. How can they pretend to dictate? How can they demand to dictate to an elected uh, government? So this is all happening. 
As we speak, there are fast food strikes going on in New York City and many other locations. Take a look at the SEIU website and the fast food agitations that are going on. This keeps it in the, uh, in the public view. And, of course, this huge turning point, the papacy of Pope Francis Bergoglio, the first third world pope. Uh, he has made a number of statements. You remember a couple of weeks ago, months ago, he did a big attack. He said, wild free market and wild free trade make the rich richer, the powerful more powerful, and the poor poorer, and the excluded more excluded. So that's got to be countered by government measures, by state measures. So says the pope, sick dixit papa, that's it. And now recently, he's attacked trickle-down economics, trickle-down economics, and the globalization of indifference. This is a detailed thing. We probably, in our uh, Christmas program at the end of the year, we'll probably go back to celebrating this uh, apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. You've got to look at it. The joy of the gospel. And uh, it's the classic Catholic social doctrine, which had been muted. It had been there, but it had been muted. It had not been on the front burner. Those wedge issues, frankly, had been on the front burner. But now this uniting issue is on the front burner, and this is going to change the world. It may indeed save European civilization from what otherwise looked like a, like a pretty um, dismal future. So um, the freakouts, of course. The moron Palin is taken aback. Limbaugh at the Institute for Retarded Reactionary Ranting, freaking out. Oh, he says, the Pope doesn't know anything about capitalism and socialism and communism. And, of course, the, the, uh, the undercurrent, right, the people from the St. Pius X Society of uh, Religious Reactionaries, they say, well, it's a communist Pope, right, that the communists have taken over the Vatican. Well, they're also now, as we've heard before, the death threats, right? The London Guardian helpfully telling us that it's the Indrangheta, the Calabrian mafia, that's not happy about the reform of the IOR. And uh, remember, the Pope says, the devil wants to see factions inside the church. All right, so all of these things add up. Plus, the arrogance and impudence and sheer incompetence of the ruling class, this Wall Street financial elite. The Republicans in the Congress, they, they want more austerity in the middle of it. These are Tea Party, fascist, and normal reactionary Republicans. We'll get to this in just a second on World Crisis Radio. Mother Agnes Mariam, National Press Club, Washington, D.C., Tuesday evening at uh, 6.37 p.m. start. And uh, a great uh, opportunity to learn all about Syria, all about the fakery of the August 21st Ghouta alleged, well, there, there was chemical weapons attack, but uh, not um, necessarily what, uh, what is claimed, or at least that's, I think, the, uh, the preponderance of the evidence. So look, uh, the arrogance and impudence of the ruling class. These reactionary Republicans, bowing to their own fascist wing, want to cut food stamps by $40 billion over the next 10 years. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? This should be a one-way ticket to Nuremberg and some rather rough treatment when you get there. But no, the Republicans, uh, they're still allowed to go on television and propose genocide against the American people without being tarred and feathered on the spot. Things are going to change. I can feel, I can feel it in the air. Uh, something else is going to come down. So the food stamp question, uh, we've just had the first Thanksgiving under the cut food stamps, right? A lot of people got really hungry at the end of November because the food stamp benefit went down at the beginning of November because... The Obama stimulus had some benefits. It certainly did. And one of them was to increase the food stamp benefit. Now it's gone back to the pre-stimulus level. And that means that more and more families are running out 
earlier in the month. Instead of making it to the 25th, maybe they can make it to the 18th or the 20th or whatever it is. So for a lot of people, that, that Thanksgiving dinner from some volunteer organization really meant a lot. They had to go for a week on that. That's food stamps. And then we've got this other one. This is another unbelievable story. You know, the uh, the un, un, uh, unemployment rate ticked down a little bit today. I think it's at 7, 7%. A lot of this stuff is people dropping out in despair, as we know. However, on the 28th of December, we have a piece of legislation called the Federal Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program is going to expire on December 28th. Right? What is that? The uh, the Feast of the Holy Innocents? I, I can't quite remember. We'll look it up. We'll see what that is. There may be some reference to King Herod of Jerusalem in there. But uh, this is now the effort of the Republicans, of course, is to sabotage this legislation. And what it will mean is that 1.3 million Americans, direct recipients, and their families, so multiply that by three or four, are going to lose whatever unemployment benefits they still have. And that's the calling card of the fascisto Republicans. Another piece of genocide, another one-way ticket to Nuremberg in my book. So this kind of arrogance, and now let's do the, 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 uh, the other one. The Detroit uh, verdict, if we can call it that, of a federal court. Uh, the federal court. Now, the Michigan Constitution says that when you have these reorganizations, you can't cut people's pensions. Those are commitments. That was collective bargaining, and it was done. People said, we'll take lower wages now because we want a better pension and better health care tomorrow. Those are contracts. And the same damn reactionaries who will tell you that contracts are sacred when the uh, contractor is a plutocrat, when it's a working person, well, those are the scum of the earth, so we sweep that aside. So the federal judge, uh, again, probably heading towards uh, a, a rendezvous in Nuremberg, this federal judge says, oh, no, forget that. We can just let a federal statute, which is not even clearly specified, we can just override that. The federal bankruptcy law... Uh, cancels out the Constitution of Michigan. Let's watch this carefully, right? All the great states' rights proponents, all the great reactionaries, Scalia and Alito and Roberts and all those guys, the rats cabal, right? Roberts, Alito, Thomas, and Scalia. They're so devoted to states' rights, as we know, right? Except except when it was uh, gore against... Uh, Bush, and now we'll see this time, because this is the Constitution, not even a statute of Michigan. The Constitution of the state of Michigan says you can't take back those pensions. How can you do that? Well, uh, it's illegal. And you can say, yeah, federal law overrides state law. It's true. I mean, from my point of view, but there's got to be a direct conflict. In other words, there's got to be a direct federal law that immediately contradicts the state law that you're talking about there. Uh, so, uh, well, this is just outrageous. So the idea is, in effect, pensioners, poor working people, are going to get the axe for what? For Goldman Sachs to pay the rotten, bankrupt, kited derivatives that the foolish administration, certainly the uh, incompetent leaders, of the city of Detroit have gotten themselves into. Those derivatives should have been banned. They should have been outlawed. Credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, super CDOs, energy derivatives, all the rest of that. Those should be illegal. And the remaining ones should be taxed at 1% with the Wall Street sales tax. That would uh, essentially have uh, given them a couple of layers of protection because a lot of these deals can't be done if the Wall Street sales tax is in place. But now we're seriously, we've got a federal court that says that, yes, you can go ahead and loot people's pensions in order to pay Wall Street. Somehow, the question always arises, will the American people lie down 
and lick the boots of Wall Street? Will they simply play dead? Will they not respond? I don't know, but I'm hoping and I'm betting and I'm trying to promote the idea that a mass upsurge against this is, uh, is in order. Remember, with Occupy Wall Street alone, with a single demand of a 1% Wall Street sales tax, tax Wall Street, not Occupy, tax, hit them where it hurts, hit them in the Labanza, make them pay. With the 1% Wall Street sales tax, you could have rammed that through Congress in the second half of 2011. And the whole situation now would look much different because you, would, you could break the power of Wall Street with a mass traction economic demand that simply says no cuts, no austerity, no more firings, no more layoffs, Wall Street sales tax, Wall Street will pay for it. So I think these sorts of things, the Republican cuts of food stamps with the, with the Democrats offering cuts, but smaller cuts, and the uh, extended unemployment, uh, these things are going to add up to a huge um, social explosion. Now, we have to look ahead here. Uh, right now, we're headed towards the 15th of December. The 15th of December is supposed to be the announcement of the Patty Murray, Paul Ryan, John Birch Society uh, budget deal. And of course, <laughs> who, would, who would, in his right mind, would put his economic fate in the hands of the, the incompetent Patty Murray, right? You've got Wall Street Democrats negotiating with reactionary Republicans, with fascist Republicans breathing down the neck of the reactionaries. So this is not a good situation. So everybody is um, going to probably mm, finesse the December 15th. That doesn't count so much because it's not the government shutdown. The government shutdown might come as early as January 15th. That's when the government runs out of money. That's when we could have another government shutdown. And a couple of weeks after that, in February, we could have another default crisis. Now, the Republicans, at least some of them, are running scared, right? Some of them know that they've gone too far. And if you do this in the springtime, as I was once told by an, an official uh, of an Eastern European country, uh, Springtime is the time for mass strike upsurge. So the Washington Post of today, for 2014, GOP may elect to be cautious. They're loath to give foes ammunition after the shutdown debacle. We'll look into this in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Let's talk to here in uh, Washington, D.C. So, the arrogance, the impudence, uh, of this ruling elite, these decadent, these degenerates, uh, after six or seven years of the privations of a world economic depression, they just don't seem to understand. They don't get it, right? Eric, this, uh, the cutting of food stamps in the depression, the cutting of extended unemployment in the depression, the cutting this Detroit court decision, this is simply illegality. This is class warfare. You want to see class warfare, that's it. And I really wonder where are our libertarian friends on this? Do we see a whole lot of indignation about people's economic rights getting taken away, right? Oh, a drone flew over my house. Yeah, your main problem is you're dying of starvation and you can't see a doctor. Uh, 26,000 Americans die per year from having no health insurance. What's the libertarian solution to that one? I tear down what exists? I don't know. Nothing? Uh, you should die consoled by the fact that you're dying for the Austrian school of von Hayek and von Mises and other founding fathers of the United States? All right. So now, uh, remember the, the, the uh, approach that we have is that the Republican Party needs to be destroyed. The Democrats need to split. Now, we've talked about the recent splits when uh, Obama, with the typical arrogance and impudence, tried to impose Larry Summers, right, the great apostle of deregulation, the bringer of derivatives, the great uh, you know, tool of Rubin and Goldman Sachs and all this. Uh, the Democratic senators said, no, we can't touch that guy. There's something else going on here. Now, here we have another very interesting one. You have this thing called the Progressive Change Campaign Committee. These are 
left-wing Democrats. Uh, I'm afraid they have the vice, if anything, is maybe to to be too cozy with certain elected uh, Democrats rather than you know giving it to you with 100 percent. But still, useful role. Uh, and they're they're attacking third way. Now, third way looks very much like the old New Democrats of Al Frum, that is to say of Al Gore and Clinton and uh, others, right? Southern right-wing uh, Democrats. The third way gets uh, a lot of money from Wall Street, the financial world, and so forth. So uh, one of these honchos from, from the third way, you can see the website, They've put. They did an uh, editorial for the uh, an article, an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, which says uh, that the economic populism of Elizabeth Warren and Bill De Blasio, Blasi, De Blasio, now the new uh, imminent uh, New York City mayor, within a couple of weeks, uh, nothing would be more disastrous for Democrats than to go the way of Warren and De Blasio. Says the third way. Uh, this is reckless. It's a fantasy. And you can see all this. There, there's a lot more in the, in the way of detail. And then the Progressive Change Campaign Committee has struck back, and they say, you've got to get this guy, Representative Joseph Crowley, Democrat of New York. Representative Joseph Crowley is a disgrace. I'm saying this now. Uh, he has worked with Third Way on a range of issues uh, and so forth. Uh, this is the guy who puts out the, you know, he's, he's on their board and he, he approves these attacks on de Blasio and Warren. Now, of course, we remember that de Blasio is a demagogue who works for Soros, but the people who voted for de Blasio thought they were voting for a left alternative. So that is uh, another interesting story. Oh, Representative James Clyburn of South Carolina is also a co-chair of third way. So you got Crowley, you got Clyburn, you got all these people. Um, the, uh, the other side of it is Representative Allison Y. Schwartz, Democrat of Pennsylvania, she says that what the third way is saying is outrageous. And we have this guy, we've seen him before, Jared Polis, P-O-L-I-S, of Boulder, Colorado. Remember, he opposed Elizabeth Warren on the 0.75% student loans, right? He was one of the wreckers on that one. So he's now saying he likes Elizabeth Warren, and he likes the third way, and he's trying to be a trimmer. That's known as straddle, Jared. Jared. That's uh, the straddle that got Bob Dole in trouble at various points in his uh, career. So it shows you... This, you may say, well, that's a tempest in a teapot. It shows that there's a latent split in the Democratic Party. And what I've been telling you is true. And we have empirical data. We've got two or three pretty interesting cases now where you can see that there's a fault line between the Wall Street plutocratic Obama, Schumer, Durbin, Democrats, and then this other group, the Elizabeth Warren. Now you got de Blasio, the uh, Sherrod Brown, Captur, de Fazio. Let's put Alison Schwartz in there, uh, and so forth. And a lot of it is coming to the surface about this idea of Hillary for president. I'm sorry, Hillary Clinton, complacent, wealthy. You saw that wedding uh, palling around with the worst Wall Street predators and plutocrats. Uh, this is unacceptable. And people notice that when Hillary comes out for her events, she says nothing. This is so bland. She's cautious. She's become more cautious. And people are now looking back from the sort of Washington insider point of view. They're all saying, well, uh, Mrs. Clinton or uh, Madame Clinton as uh, Secretary of State was pointless. She did nothing. Well, of course, what she did was she was the face under which the Arab Spring and the attempted destabilization of Iran and all kinds of other things were, were uh, organized. But you get the idea. In terms of initiatives, right, you compare her to Kerry in terms of energy and, you know, going around. She went a million miles, and she did absolutely nothing. That reminds me of what old Big News said, uh, that right, she had been in 120 countries, and he said, that's nothing. My travel agent has been in 160 countries and is still not qualified 
for the presidency. Of course, Bignier was saying that in the service of Barkey, so sorry. Um, to de- destroy the Republican Party, uh, Harry Reid, I think, is trying to goad them, using the nuclear option to make them fight. If they can't fight, if these senators, Republican senators, can't fight on the appointees, they may say, well, then let's, let's go to the mat on the budget and shut down the government or something like this. The sure path to Republican destruction. Uh, the Republicans say, oh, no, we're going to go for oversight. In other words, carping and nitpicking. Their problems are growing, right? The, every time the Obamacare website gets better, these demagogues lose uh, an argument. So I say a two-point program. Let's make it simple. The Wall Street sales tax, 1%. Save Detroit, save the social safety net, roll back austerity. One of the other interesting things we have here in the Washington uh, Post is the idea, this is in the uh, December 1st issue, more liberal populist effort emerging in Democratic Party ahead of 2016. Democratic Party feeling heat from a revived left. And one of the things they correctly point to is that Obama has been yapping for years that he's happy to cut Social Security with the chained CPI. And that is unacceptable. And uh, this is just, uh, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's economically terrible, right? And they don't like the idea of the disciples of Robert Rubin, people like uh, Lawrence uh, Summers and so forth, uh, having such a big role in it. And this is serious enough so that Podesta, right, the Clintonista, he runs the Center for American Progress, which is the Clinton uh, think tank, the Clinton shadow cabinet, if you will. They have created a left-wing tentacle called, let's see if we have it in here, uh, Center, no, I'm sorry, Center for Equitable Growth. So that's a left-wing sham, bogus fake to try to keep you in the Clinton orbit, but with the sort of a tolerated left-wing Clintonism. I'm sorry, it's time to fight on program, and we have the program, so we'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, what's good in Washington, D.C., reminding you, Mother Agnes Mariam, the heroine, the Joan of Arc of Syria in our time, except she does it for peace, not for military measures or conflict or war. At the National Press Club, Washington, D.C., Tuesday evening next at uh, 6.30 to 7. And um, please do everything you can to make that a success. Now, just a couple of more things about the split in the Democratic Party. Uh, We've been following Warren, right? We don't like her foreign policy. Let's let's bracket that for the moment. But the 0.75% student loan uh, policy paid for by the Federal Reserve with that money wrenched out of the hands of helicopter Ben Bernanke or this Yellen. If we don't have Tarpley for Fedhead, it's going to be Yellen. I recommend Tarpley for Fedhead once again. N- not too late, right? She hasn't been uh, been confirmed yet, although it's imminent, maybe imminent, probably before Christmas. If we don't get Tarpley for Fedhead, it's going to be Yellen. Uh, 0.75% through the discount window. If a bank can borrow, then so can a, uh, a student. Good. That's good. The beginnings of a good policy, let's say. Not the end, but the beginning. So uh, she's got now, a, from uh, Elizabeth Warren, we have the proposal to increase Social Security benefits. Yes, we have been in favor of this for quite a while. We've said it because the 401K system and the IRA system was destroyed by the 2008 crash arranged by the Wall Street predators, finance oligarchs, speculators, bloodsuckers, lampreys, kicks, eels, and others, jackals, vultures. That means that Social Security will now have to actually be a pension that you can live on with some kind of human dignity. The only problem with Elizabeth Warren, of course, is she doesn't say who should pay. And this opens the door then to a fight. Oh, the young people are going to be clipped, but the oldies, forget all that. Override all of that divide-and-conquer stuff. Make Wall Street pay. An integral part of the Warren proposal on 
the uh, increase of Social Security benefits, which is laudable. It opens this debate. I might not be saying this in quite the current form without that proposal, but it's got to be paid for by the Wall Street sales tax. She's also in favor of cracking down on banks and so forth. She might run for president. It would only be a good thing to pull the entire political situation in the direction of anti-bank, anti-Wall Street measures, at the very least. We've also got Bernie Sanders up in Vermont. He says he may run for president if no liberal, uh, I don't know, liberal, I'm for economic populism, I'm for anti-Wall Street and anti-war. That's where Warren has to get her her, uh, program in order. Uh, So these are the things that are now uh, going on. The other thing, of course, is the stuff about the the minimum wage. Now, Obama has climbed on this train since it was already leaving the station. I think I mentioned before, way back in uh, Tuesday, November 26th, the Washington Post had this thing about low-wage workers, and they profile John Stewart, who uh, gets up at 1.30 a.m. to make a shift at the Philadelphia airport that starts at 4. He's got to take two buses. He's 55 years old. Clip-on tie, white cotton shirt with a frayed collar, a pair of black sneakers from $13, and uh, he has a candy bar for lunch. He suffers from psoriasis, which is increased by financial stress. Well, I'm sorry. We need a real minimum wage with some teeth. The other interesting thing about the minimum wage, as I've always said, If you think immigration is a problem, and it can be under certain circumstances, the way you obviate that problem is to put a floor under everybody. In other words, if you think some immigrant is going to undercut you in the labor market, fine. Obviate it. Get that out of the way. Take it off the table with a minimum wage so that you'll be actually competing at the same economic level if you need to, and you can let your, presumably, if you think you have better skills, then you'll prevail. Okay. Now, uh, the uh, Washington Post also helps us with a very useful map. Municipalities, sick of waiting on the reactionary Republicans and their fascisto wing. This is now the Friday, November 29th, right after Thanksgiving. Localities lead push to increase minimum wage. Efforts in Congress have stalled. Democrats see a chance to court the working class. That's a good posture. Fight them. Uh, some, for some of these people in the House and even the Senate, it's real. For the Obama, we have to see. We have to assume it's counterinsurgency. When the Pope starts criticizing trickle-down economics, you know the gulf between rich and poor has become too much to ignore, says a Democratic consultant uh, mentioned here. The leading edge is SeaTac Airport in Washington State. $15 minimum wage starting in January there's a vote, vote. There's a vote recount, but it looks like they've won. Uh, some other places in New Jersey, at the same point that the Garden State Göring was uh, reelected, his uh, minimum wage policy, his veto of an increase, was overridden by the voters. New Jersey goes to eight dollars and twenty-five cents. Here in the enlightened state of Maryland, Montgomery and Prince George's counties are going to eleven fifty. By October 1st, 2017, that's through a series of steps uh, over time, okay? And the District of Columbia has just gone to, I believe, 1150 in the past couple of days. Um, And this is to the good, right? Don't listen to these idiotic, you know, Austrian reactionary fascisto um, arguments about, oh, that's going to cut. Here, I'll give you a summary. Uh, George Mason, here, George Mason University School of Public Policy. Guess who pays for that? Koch. The Koch brothers pay. So here we have Stephen Fuller, paid ideologue, economist, Center for Regional Analysis, George Mason University School of Public Policy. The raise will have an effect in terms of lost jobs, lost income, higher wages, lost sales to adjacent areas. Baloney. Baloney. We're going to reform the entire society. In other words, we're simply going to fundamentally um, restore the distribution patterns that prevailed at a more successful time in the New Deal. We're going to roll back 
the maldistribution, the misalignment of incomes, which emerged during that long reactionary nightmare known as the Southern Strategy, much lamented and now gone, 1968 to 2008. That was the nightmare. That was the long, dark tunnel of the soul.